praise God. Yes. Also, I want to say I know there were uh, some of you that, that work in ministries, and it's it's hard sometimes when you do something like this to just get everybody you know that is a part of it now and then. So we honor all of you. I know, like CJ back there, he's just recently yeah. taken our yeah, uh, video or what do I call it? It's a Christian talk show. Christian talk show yeah. internet <laughs> ministry. We have a you know we have a, a YouTube page, and if you want to. And look up our services and watch the services on it right now. He's filming it live for people to watch it. It's also live and on so Facebook. That's a very important part, too. We had a couple of Sundays ago, we had was it seven people that gave their lives to Christ. Yeah, to the Amen. hallelujah! Amen. Praise God! So we appreciate everyone. Yes, and on if, if God's just told you to come here, be here, learn and grow, and do what you know that part, then that's just as important as anything else. Amen. You always need to be open to what he might have you do, because uh, I find that uh, you know he's going to have you somehow be a vehicle for ministry, whether it's inside this church or even outside this church. But uh, just let him lead you, and we really appreciate you. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Well, Father, we thank you this morning. Give us utterance this morning. Help me to say what you want me to say, and hide me from my own ideas. Lord, I pray for open ears, for open eyes, for all of us, and a heart that discerns. And as we just share here for a few moments your word, let the let the, the rhema word of God yes. explode in our hearts. Holy Spirit, teach us today. Teach us, not just through my mouth, but teach us uh, directly today and speak to us. And we'll take what you show us and we'll run with it. We'll go with it. We thank you, Father, for uh, Carlo. Uh, Tut, we pray in Jesus' name for healing yeah. her body. Thank you, God. We uh, pray, Father God, for Pauline living good and the difficulty she's been having in her body. We pray for your strength and your intervention. We pray for Steve Jones yes. and the challenges he's facing. Lord, we're so thankful that you are our healer. And we pray in Jesus' name for any other person, Lord, this morning that may be being prayed for right now by your people. We pray in Jesus' name that the blessing of God would come to them. The angels of God would be dispatched on their behalf yes, and that the body of Christ would be activated yes, to minister to them, yes, to help them in Jesus' yes. name. Yes. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, I want to uh, just try to keep this short. Of course, you know you really need to pray when I say stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to share an experience. To be honest with you, I have, I've struggled with whether to share this or not because... Um, Oh, I guess it's probably just more a, a thing with me personally. But, um, uh, you know, God's ways, the Bible says in Isaiah, God's ways are not our ways. Yeah. Yeah. And the Bible, if, if it's anything, it's supernatural. Yeah. One of the problems in our nation today is the church has moved away from that element of the word and of the church right. and of God's kingdom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've tried to substitute rationality for spirituality. Now, what I mean by that is... Uh, you know, even our educational system is based, it's a Greek-based educational system, and the bottom line truth of that system is if it's not rational, it's not real. Rational to man's mind. But the problem with that is, we don't know much. The greatest intellect among us, compared to what God knows and how God moves, knows about that much. Amen? Amen? And so Paul, over 1 Corinthians, one of my favorite areas of Scripture is Paul, over 1 Corinthians, he explained his ministry to people. He said, I didn't come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom. But he said, I came in the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, I let the Holy Spirit work through me to reveal, to say, to act, whether he was praying for someone, whatever he was doing. He let the Holy Spirit have the lead. And many times God is moving uh, in a way that your mind can't comprehend. Right. I've had to learn over the years uh, to back up a step and not judge things so quickly and open my heart and say, Lord, is this you? If it is, show it to me in your word and explain it to me so that I can yield to it. Yes. Amen. Yes. Right. Amen. And if you're, not, if you're not growing and changing in that way in your life, you're really not making much progress as a Christian. Moving right along since that went over real big. 
But one way uh, that God moves is he moves in a prophetic flow. It's primarily the way he moves. And what we mean by that is he uses the prophetic realm, and the prophetic realm could be everything from someone prophesying inspired speech. In other words, uh, what we asked a while ago, God, hide me from my words and let, your, let the Holy Spirit dictate my words. And the Bible says that God will do that. Or in 1 Corinthians, he talks... Paul was writing to the church at, at uh, Corinth, and he was he was instructing them to keep, how to keep their spiritual uh, things in order and in balance. And he said, "You may all prophesy one by one. Every one of you, you have the spirit of prophecy in you. The Holy Spirit is in you, and He probably speaks out of your mouth more than you even though He does." Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Amen. So, uh, understanding that we are a three-part being. First Thessalonians five, I think it's twenty-nine, says that we are a spirit. We have a soul, a mind, a will, an emotion, yeah. and we live in a body. Mm -hmm. We're made in the likeness and image of God. God is one God manifest in three persons, God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Yeah. So we're simply made in his, his way. So your soul, your mind, will, and emotions, it, it's like a computer. It takes in information, but you and I don't, our, our computer hasn't been programmed like God's computer. God <laughs> understands everything all the time, everywhere. He understands the future better than we understand the past. Yeah. And he moves by his spirit through us spiritually. Now your spirit man, the real you on the inside, that person, that being, that real you that lives on the inside of this tent, this, this temple, this body that he's given us to live in on this earth, your spirit man has the ability to know. To know. In other words, there, uh, the Bible says over in 1 Corinthians, it says that uh, we have a witness or a knowing in our spirit. Yes. Yes. If we're born of God, yes. our spirit, it says over there, bears witness with his spirit that we're children of God. Yeah. Amen. You can know something spiritually right. and not understand it intellectually. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's like here a few weeks ago, Mike was preaching one Sunday night. And we were going out over the internet live like we are right now. He got to the end of the service. And the Holy Spirit, who knows everything, <coughs> said to him and, and, and revealed his mind a word of knowledge, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's a, a, a piece of knowledge that God has and knows about something present or something in the past. And he'll give that to you to use that to minister to somebody. Right. And Mike was given a word of knowledge that night. And the word of knowledge was uh, double knee. And he said, I don't understand that. I don't even know what that is or what that's about. But the bottom line, just to make it real quick, there was a lady uh, watching online who was living in another state. And her seven-month-old baby was born with a deformity on one of his knees to where he his, his leg was trying to grow two knees. Come on. And so he was prayed for. And long story short, she contacted us the next day. She'd taken it to the doctor, got another x-ray, and his, he had one knee. It was perfectly normal. Praise God. So Mike had no way as a human to know there was somebody in Wisconsin that had that situation, but as he yielded to what the Holy Spirit was causing him to know, even though he didn't understand, God was able to use it. Amen? So God moves in those ways. And one of the ways he moves, or a couple of different ways, is through dreams and visions. He also just brings revelation to you. Peter, you know, Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And they said, you're, you're this, this, this. And so who do you say I am? Peter said, you're the Christ. You're the, you're the uh, anointed one. You're the Messiah. Yeah. You're the son of the living God. You're that one we've been praying for to come. Yeah. And Jesus says, Peter, you are blessed. And the word blessed there means, Peter, you're operating the way God operates. Yeah. You're operating in the characteristics yeah. of God. God. He said, because flesh and blood, with their <laughs> limited knowledge, didn't reveal this to you. Right. But my Father, which is in heaven, by the agency of the Holy Spirit, by the person of the Holy Spirit, yes. revealed this to you, and you knew it. Yes. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And so sometimes in dreams and visions, the scriptures say that God speaks to us once, even twice, and we don't pick up on it. We don't perceive exactly. it. Right. So in a dream, in a vision of the night, God opens our ears and seals our instructions so that he can hide us from the pride of man. Amen, Lord. God has different ways of dealing with us, and I, I realize I've thrown a lot out there, and there's a lot of explanation to that, and there are things that are, uh, uh, you know, there are dreams that are pizza dreams, there's dreams that are God dreams, uh, you know, there's uh, all kinds of stuff in the spirit realm, there's evil spirits, there's 
angels, all that. There's this new age thing, which is a, uh, a mixture of uh, really new uh, old age religion from the Far East and all these kinds of things. There's a lot in that. But I'm not here to explain that today, except to say to you that God does supernaturally, and if you begin to study His ways and open yourself up to them, uh, he'll, he'll begin to use those things in your life. You may have already used them, but you didn't know what they were, so you didn't uh, you know, pick up on it. But he, here recently, He ministered something to me about where we're at right now and where we're going uh, here in the future. We are in the end of the end of days. Yeah, we are. The scriptures teach that with God, a day is as a thousand years. And science has proved that through the speed of light. And of course, God lives outside of time. And so he lives in a realm. God is light and so forth. There's a whole teaching on that that's really powerful and wonderful. But God sees a thousand year period on this earth as one day. And after four days, after 4,000 years... Jesus came, but if you, if you study the scripture, you see that man basically was created at the beginning of the first day of time, and that 6,000 years, there's going to be a 6,000 year period that we will have on this earth to do and be and do what we're supposed to do, and at the end of that 6,000th year, at the beginning of the 7,000th year, the seventh day, Jesus will return. And he will take over as king of kings, lord of lords, and he will rule on this earth for a thousand years. And so you and I, Jesus came at the, the uh, beginning of the, uh, the, the fourth day, or the end of the fourth day, actually, and uh, was here on earth, went to the cross, did what he needed to do to set things legally in order so that the devil had no more place or no opportunity to dominate us forever. And then, of course, gave us the Great Commission, gave us the... Uh, the message to go and preach and the signs and wonders to go and work and to do. And at the, at the end of that fourth day, Peter stood up at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell on 120 and, and, and all of a sudden these supernatural manifestations were happening uh, beyond man's intellect that people could understand. They said, what meaneth this? Peter stood up under the anointing of the Spirit. He said, this is that which was prophesied by Job in the last days. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And then he went on to explain it. And so the last days, the last two days, began at that time, the day of Pentecost, which is about 2,000 years ago, close to 2,000 years ago. So that's why I say you and I are living at the end of that sixth day. We're living at that, in that place uh, where God is going to wind this thing up. And here's the good news about it. He says, when Jesus says when he comes back, He's going to come back for a glorious church. Hallelujah. What is a glorious church? A glorious church is a church that looks like Him. Yes. In word and in deed. Hallelujah. Praise God. You say, well, I don't know how in the world He's going to get that done. Well, you're not God. So just go with the flow and let Him do it. Amen. But He, in, in sharing things with us and preparing us, He comes sometimes in these supernatural ways. And I've had Him do that. I've had a few... Uh, spiritual dreams over the years. I haven't had a lot of them, but I've had some at key moments. And here the other day, uh, you know, the, the, the Jewish, under the Old Testament, God gave the Jews seven redemptive feasts through a year. God works in circles. He works in cycles. The reason he works in a circle is not because he's running in a circle. It's because he wants to create a barrier against the enemy that you can live inside of that the devil can't penetrate. Yeah. Yeah. He wants your family circle with the devil out. He doesn't want the heads broken. So he gave his family, when he, he chose the Jews to be his chosen people to reveal himself in the earth, he gave them the law, and he gave them seven redemptive feasts, or holy days, you could say. He gave them these seven redemptive feasts. Four of them are in the spring. Three of them are in the fall. And then, of course, when Jesus came, he began to fulfill those days because he was what those days were pointing at. Amen? Amen. And we don't have time to go into all of that and explain it, except to say, in the fall, one of those days, which we just recently had, was the, the Day of Atonement. Everybody say the Day of Atonement. Yeah. The Day of Atonement was the most high and holy day, and still is today to believing Jews uh, in Israel. It's a day when, without going into a lot of details, it was a, it's a day when, ten days before, trumpets were blown on the Feast of Trumpets to alert people that you've got ten days before the Day of Atonement, and that's the day that God is going to deal with the sin of the nation. Yeah. It's going to be either good for you or it's going to be bad for you. Right. 
And so you have 10 days, they call them days of awe. Yeah. Days to focus on God and let God search you. God, is there anything I need to repent of? Is there anything I need to make right? Do I owe somebody money and I've forgotten I need to pay it? Just whatever it is. Man. But mainly to get your heart right, keep your heart right, make any adjustments. Put yourself in a spiritual position to where when the blood sacrifice is offered, it will actually work for you. Amen. Amen. So you don't get something because you mouth some words. You get something because you mouth words out of a, a heart that believes and a heart that's right. Amen. 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 And in the Old Testament, there's much teaching. Isaiah 58 is one of the great chapters where God's talking to them and saying, this is why you're going through the feast, but it's not working for you. The blessing's not there like it should be. The enemy has access to you. Yeah. Yeah. Paul had to correct them over in 1 Corinthians 11 because they were, having, they were having the body and blood of the Lord, but yet their hearts weren't right toward each other. And so many of them, it says, were weak, many were sick, and many died prematurely. Mm -hmm. So anyway, moving right along since you got excited about that, here, the, uh, here a few days back, I've, I've heard for years people say, you know, on the Day of Atonement every year, and there again, I don't think we necessarily as Christians have to keep these days the way the Jews kept them, but they are prophetic. God's the one that created what we call the Jewish calendar. It's his calendar in the scriptures, and it's based on the lunar cycle. The, 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 the calendar we go by in our country, it's based on the sun, and it was established by Roman emperors, and I used to think it was all demonic, <coughs> because of where it came from. And last year, the Lord straightened me out on that. He said, no, he said, you know, I can use people that aren't, uh, uh, you know, following me. Yeah, hey amen. That don't understand me. I can use them for a purpose. The Bible says that God can, can turn the heart of the king. Yes. The hand of the Lord can turn the heart of the king just like it turns the rivers and the, and the, yes. and the, and the earth. Yes. Amen? Yes. Yes. And he shows me that, that, that our calendar is based, even though it's based out of a Roman culture, it's based on the, the death, the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. So anyway, but here uh, a few days back on the day of atonement, I woke up, uh, you know, the Jewish day starts in the evening. And, and then, you know, it's over, the full day is over the next evening. And then I went to bed that night. It was on the Day of Atonement. I knew it was. It was on my calendar. And I prayed. And I said, Lord, I hear all these people say they get revelations on the Day of Atonement. And they have these encounters with you. I've never had one of those. I'd sure like to have one. Yeah. <laughs> so I went to bed that night. And I, I'm kind of a, I sleep sometimes two to four hours. And I wake up for an hour or two. Then I go back to bed. That just kind of, I've tried not, I've tried everything to not do that, but it just seems like that's the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's amazing uh, how awake God is in the middle of the night. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that night I went to bed. I woke up about three in the morning. I got up. Flynn Ann was sitting there, and uh, and I, I just was, you know, my mind was kind of. I said, Lord, you know, I, I just reiterated again. I've heard people, you know, say they get these revelations on the Day of Atonement, but you know, I didn't get one. He says, I gave you one this evening. I said, you did? He said, yeah. But see, I didn't pick it up. God speaks once, yet twice, but we don't perceive it. Wow. And I said, well, what do you mean? Now, here's where you're going to have to hang with me a little bit. He said it was the ball game you watched. Yeah. The baseball game. Yeah. Now, Jesus, when he taught people, he used natural things to explain spiritual truths. Yeah. The sower sows the word. Mm -hmm. right. He used the whole seed harvest process to explain things. God will still do that. Matter of fact, if you want to, I believe God is many times speaking to us in our society in many ways, but because we're carnally minded about it and not spiritually minded, we don't pick up on the sign that's being given to us. Now, I realize not everything is, and I realize you can get weird with this, too. But I do believe that God does this at times. And I said, Lord, what do you mean? Now, I just watched... The San Francisco Giants. Come on. And the Chicago Cubs play baseball that night. Cubs fans. Lay hands on her and pray for her. But, uh, you know, I've been a Giant fan ever since I was a little kid. We moved to California in 56. The Giants got here in 58. Willie Mays was my hero growing up. All this stuff. Uh, we love baseball in our family. And, you know, I, and I'm a, I watch the Giants during the season as often as I can, that kind of thing. But 
there again, the Lord showed me, he said, that that game was a prophetic sign to you. You asked me to give you something on the Day of Atonement, and I did it. Yeah. Happened that night. Wow. Now, this game was a game in the playoffs, and you had to win three out of five games to move on to the, the league championship uh, in this, this, this game they were in. The Giants were, had lost one, uh, two games and had won one, and they were ahead in this ball game that night on the Day of Atonement of the Cubs. In the ninth inning, they were ahead 5-2 to two in the bottom of the ninth, or top of the ninth. The Cubs came back in that inning, and they scored six runs. The Giants did score. The Cubs won. They won the three games, and they went on. Of course, now they're even in the World Series right now. Which, if you're a Cub fan, you better pray. You're down 3-1 right now. <laughs> now, uh, I said, Lord, what do you mean? And now, here's what he said to me. I, mean, I have to explain this thing, especially if you're not a baseball person. He said, the Giants don't have a closer. A closer in baseball is a, usually a hard-throwing person. Throws the ball really hard. They bring them in, usually if, you're, if they're ahead in the ball game or tied, they bring them in the last inning or two, and they come in throwing the ball hard, challenging hitters, just trying to overwhelm the hitters to close the deal, close the game. <laughs> now the Giants, and they even said mid-season, uh, after the, the trading thing was over and all that, they said that they made a big mistake not you know, buying or, or, or buying somebody's contract who was a good closer. They were trying to close with people who were struggling, closing, and not able to get the, the job done. One guy had an arm injury, another guy just whatever, for whatever reason, he just couldn't seem to get the job done. And the Giants lost 30 games this year in the last inning. And so I'm saying, Lord, the Giants don't have a closer. What are you talking about? <laughs> and he began to talk to me uh, about the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was when the high priest, one time a year, on the Day of Atonement, was allowed by God to literally come into the Holy of Holies where the Shekinah presence of God was. He had to go in according to the way God told him to prepare himself. And he would go in and he would sprinkle blood seven times, sacrificial blood, on behalf of the nation, behalf of himself and behalf of the nation, and God, whose people's hearts were right, they were honoring the Day of Atonement in its purpose, and they were participating in it spiritually. God would honor that blood sacrifice, and he would cover the sins of the nation for the past year. And that's why in Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11 talks a lot about that. It, it says that they could walk out of that day into the next day with no sin consciousness. They could be free of sin consciousness. Because their sins had been dealt with. That's what happened on the Day of Atonement. And so the, pre, the high priest was in charge of closing out the year. He was a closer. Amen? He was a closer. And just like in baseball, that closer, his job is to see to it that this thing stops here. They don't score any more runs. It's over. Amen? Now, the, the, the Cubs... Haven't been in the World Series since 1908 or something like that. They haven't, and, and they uh, hadn't been in, in the, or they hadn't won it, I think, since then. They hadn't been in the series since 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 48, was that what it was? There was a guy back in, I thought it was 45, but back in the 40s, somewhere there, who owned a bar in Chicago. And it was called the Goat Something Bar. This guy literally had a goat he kept in his bar. And he would he, he smelled like a goat. Have you ever smelled a goat? Whoa. He went to the game, the Chicago Cubs game, and he smelled so bad they made him leave. And he cursed the Cubs when he left. They never gonna win anything anymore. And the people, now, now whether that was a legitimate curse or not is really not the issue, but here's the thing about curses. If you think something's a curse and you start believing it, yeah. it'll be a curse. Yeah. 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 You know, well, that's another sermon. I won't get into that. So, so this goat thing became like a something that would come up in the, you know, the media. I even, watching that game that night, there was a guy sitting in the stands, apparently a giant man, trying to, you know, put the curse on the 
on the Cubs or something. He had this big goat mask on. The guy's drinking beer for a goat mask. <laughs> Now, on the Day of Atonement, part of the process of getting the blood prepared in order to make the uh, offering, there was a bullock that was offered as, as a burnt offering, and his blood was spilled, and a bullock is, is always um, symbolic of a burden bearer. In the book of Mark, is Jesus being that, that ox or that bullock or that, that servant to bear the burdens. So if you study the book of Mark, you, you'll see that. But, this, but another thing they did was they brought in two goats. And the, the uh, high priest cast lots, kind of like rolling dice almost type thing. And these goats, the one that was chosen was the goat for God. The other one that wasn't was called the scapegoat. Anybody ever, ever heard the term scapegoat? That's where this come from, comes from. The scapegoat was... A goat, now, now what's going on here? They're actually dealing with the past sins of the nation. And for anybody who participated in that, the priest would at one point lay his hands on the head of the scapegoat and symbolically transfer all of the sins of the nation on this one goat. They would take that goat, lead him out into the wilderness, and he would go into a place uninhabited. Amen? What does the Bible say about us? Our sins will be taken as far as the east is from the west. They'll be cast into the sea of forgetfulness. Amen? And so, that curse, and here's this ball game, this goat's, you know, there are people are talking about the curse. The, the curse was put on that goat. The other goat was killed. And his blood, with the blood of the uh, bullock, was taken by the priest into the Holy of Holies. The priest had to offer up, uh, he had to take fire from the altar, which was holy fire, and he had to put that in with the uh, incense and go in with that burning. And a cloud of incense filled the, the, uh, the Holy of Holies. It was like a covering of praise and honor, a sweet-smelling savor to God that would cover him until he could make the sacrifice. And then he would do what God had told him to do and sprinkle the blood seven times over the mercy seat. God would accept the blood. He would accept all that had been done. And he would erase the sins of the nation over the past. And the priests would come out and they would enter into a new time. And then five days later, they'd have another feast called the Feast of Tabernacles, which was an eight-day party of praise, worship, and hallelujah to God. And thanksgiving for the harvest that he given him and all those kinds of things. Lord. So the Lord began to remind me about this. It says there's a, there's a goat involved here. You know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen? Jesus was made to be sin. A lot of people struggle with this kind of thing because they have it they have it so strong in their mind that Jesus never sinned. That's right. Well, that goat never sinned either. That's right, right. Goats can't sin. But there was a transference. Yeah. A spiritual transference upon Jesus became sin. Why do you think Jesus cried on the cross, My Father, why have you forsaken me? He didn't lie, he didn't exaggerate. He didn't speak evangelistically. That's stretching it a little. Yeah. He told the truth. See, he literally was made to be sin. The Father, because of his love for us, and Jesus, because of his love for us, they went through this process where the Father literally turned his back, and Jesus, for the first time and forever, felt the absence of the presence of his Father in his life. Because for a short period of time, our sins were transferred on him. Hallelujah. Praise God. People say, well, I don't believe that. I don't believe that he died spiritually. Well, whatever he didn't do for you, you got to do for yourself. Right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Now, giants. Let's get back to the giants. <laughs> giants in the Bible are symbolic of what? Well, you got Goliath and his four brothers. Giants today, you, know, you can look at that and say it's, it's any, because the word, the name Goliath means soothsayer. 
It's a false prophetic, it's a big mouth right. demon that's using some kind of overwhelming looking situation to mouth off to try to prophesy our future, which is doom and destruction and whatever, to get you to subjugate yourself to him and live under him. If you, anything you face that looks bigger and better than you, and I'm not talking about people, I'm talking about circumstances and situations, that is a spiritual giant. And if you listen to him through those circumstances or however he's speaking to you, he'll, you'll do exactly what Israel did when Goliath was down there mouthing off. The whole army would run up hide in the, in the rocks. But there was a little guy by the name of David. And he had an anointing on him to be king. Amen? He had an anointing on him to be king. He had been anointed to be king. And so he, you know the story, I don't have time to go into all the details anyway, how he showed up and he was there to, to give his brothers some food and ask about their welfare and all this, and then he heard what was going on, and basically he said, how come nobody's taking care of this? There you go. And of course, all of his brothers, who were intimidated by it, immediately they started mouthing off to him and blaming him and uh, you know, accusing him of things that he wasn't there to do. Right. Amen? Amen? But he had a kingly anointing upon his life. Not only that, Goliath was standing on the ground that was his inheritance. Yes. That ground he was on belonged to him. Yes, and <clears throat> David understood that because he had a covenant with God, and not only that, he had a kingly anointing. Now listen, you've got a kingly anointing. Yes. Amen. He, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. The Apostle John, a New Testament Christian apostle, wrote down there and said... He, Jesus, has made us, already made us, kings and priests unto our God. We have a priesthood ministry of prayer on behalf of people as we pray to God and we do the things we do toward heaven on behalf of the earth. But we also have a place of dominion and authority. And this is the area that much of the church does not understand and they don't operate in it. And the devil just has high carnival in their life because they don't put him in his place. Well, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 6, that you and I have been raised up and made spiritually to sit together. Yeah. Anytime you see Jesus sitting, it's because he's ruling and reigning as a king. Kings sit on thrones and rule and reign. They call the shots. They make the laws. They make the decrees. Yeah. You and I are so one with him, we've been raised up and made to sit together with him in heavenly places. Yeah. And those heavenly places, as it says in Ephesians 1, are far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that's named in this world. Amen. Not only in this age, but that which is to come. Yes. So there's a, Jesus has that Melchizedek office, which is king and priest, and we partake not only of the priesthood part, but we partake of the authority part as well. Amen. The Lord expects us. To listen to him as king, and whatever he's decreeing, we're to decree. Yes. Yes. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right. Well, the Lord's going to do it. No. He is. Ephesians, or, uh, Psalms 115 says that the heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he's given to the children of men. That's right. Amen. This business, this doctrine in the church that, well, God's in control of everything is nonsense. That's right. Yeah. Now, God is in control of certain things he hasn't put in the hands of men. We're not going to tell God what day to show up on this earth again. <laughs> but at the same time, just like with Adam and Eve, he created him and said, now take dominion. They didn't do it. And what happened? God didn't come in and kill the devil or throw the devil in the lake of fire and start. He couldn't. He'd already given a de delegated authority to Adam and he was there for 6,000 years. And so if Adam gave that authority away, there's nothing he could do about it except to go through the, 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 repentant, the, the, the process of Jesus Christ coming and being that sacrifice for us to turn things around. But when Jesus turned things around and he rose from the dead, he says, all right and might has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Now you go use it. Yes. You cast out the devil. When he's encroaching on your territory, tell him, shut your mouth and get out of here in the name of Jesus. Yes. Sprinkle a little blood of Jesus on him. That'll make you run. <laughs> Hallelujah. You get all fired up preaching about this stuff. So David understood that. He had a covenant with God. He was one with God in covenant. 
through the Abrahamic covenant. Yes. And David looked at this giant. And the Lord was showing me cubs. What are cubs? They're little, little bears. Yeah. Young bears. David was a young man. In the old King James, King Saul called him a stripling. <laughs> That's an old English word for, you know, just a young guy. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, David stepped up. He stood up. Uh, he, he stepped in and he understood that kingly thing. When his brother criticized him and said, you just want to see a battle, you want to see blood, he turned and looked at him and he said, is there not a cause? Right. 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 Now, what was the cause? That word cause in the, in the original language means an issue or a word. It could even mean a word. The cause was, number one, I've, I've got the king's anointing on me, and yeah. kings are anointed. Now listen, here's what you're anointed to do, king, to provide and protect. Yeah. You are there to provide and protect. I can't go well, I wish I could just go on forever. Okay. But you have an authority. Yeah. I don't let the devil do what he wants to do in my family. I tell him what he's not going to do. That's right. Amen. Christians are way too nice to the devil. <laughs> I want to walk in love. Well, you do. <laughs> if somebody broke in and was trying to hurt my family, do you know how I'd walk in love with them? I'd kill that person. If I had to. Yeah. God loves us enough. He's going to defend us. Yep. Yes. Yep. But the devil sold the church on this stuff of, well, you know, maybe the will of the Lord for me to let the devil just stomp on my head for a while. Yeah. <laughs> let me get back over here. So the giants represented a false prophetic voice, a false set of circumstances. You know, you see Goliath, you see Ahab and Jezebel. Yeah. They were like spiritual giants in their day. They had the whole nation intimidated, forcing them to not only worship God, but worship Baal. And if you got too far on the God side, they killed you. Yeah. Amen? There's different, you know... Scenarios, people, circumstances that, that are like spiritual giants in the uh, in the Bible that we can look at those uh, right. examples. But David understood that he, that he had an anointing upon him to deal with this situation. Now, the giants and cubs, when they were playing that night, they went into the top of the ninth inning. The giants were ahead five. They had five, and the cubs had two. In the Bible, five is the number of grace. You see, the devil has an angelic anointing or mantle on his life, gifting. Yeah. And he has an ability to, through deception, to manipulate people's minds and circumstances to make you think you're in the driver's seat. Yeah. It's like a false grace mm -hmm. or a false anointing type of thing. Mm -hmm. That's good. Now, the real grace and anointing is God, amen? But the, the, the Davids, the Cubs, had two friends. Two in the Bible can be can speak of God and man working together. See, that's what we need to be doing on this earth, yeah. is working together with Him. If you'll work with Him, He'll work with you. Yeah. I know him back in 2010, when He began to teach me, He told me I didn't know Him very well as King, and He started teaching me about Him being King and how to cooperate with Him in that office that He stands in. One of the things He told me, He said, if you don't learn this stuff I'm teaching you right now about the angels and about their things, He said, you're going to be the missing link on the earth. And God gave authority to men on the earth. Yes. Yes. You know, if God's uh, in control of everything going on this earth, He's doing a lousy job. Sure. Right. He's letting little children be beheaded by crazy, maniacal people. He's letting people be raped. He's letting people go crazy. He's not in charge of all of this. No, no more than He was in charge of everything when Adam and Eve sinned and let the devil in the door. Right. And the devil wants you to think. That you're just this puppet on a string and you just kind of float through life singing, Kumbaya, Lord, Kumbaya. Right. Somebody, I heard one preacher say, that song is going to be illegal in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether that's true or not. But the point is this, is that those, those cubs, even though they looked like they were in an overwhelming situation, the giants didn't have anybody to seal the deal. Now our closer, if I can use that term, our closer, David was a closer. Amen? David threw the ball hard. He hit him so hard with that rock it went into his head. Now I've been hit in the head with rocks as a kid. I've seen other people get hit in the head with rocks. I've never seen anybody have it penetrate their skull. 
Amen? Amen. Praise God. So David was a closer. He closed the, the he shut down the, the era of 40 days of intimidation for God's people. He put the he, he stopped the thing, he stopped the, the giant, he shut it down, and in look in overwhelming looking circumstances, he under the anointing was a closer. Yeah. Jesus, when he went to the cross, he was the greatest closer of all. Amen. The Bible says that he, he, he bled seven times. Paid seven is the number of perfect completions of the Bible. He paid the price for every kind of thing that came into this earth, spiritually, naturally, emotionally, you name it. Whatever came in, he, you can study it. I preach a message on it, the seven times Jesus bled, and he covered it all. He reversed the curse in all of it. Amen. He closed the door legally on the devil. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then he, he went into the bowels of the earth, took the authority of hell and death away from the devil, received from his father authority over three levels, over heaven, the earth, and hell, rose from the dead victorious and demonstrated that he had that victory by rising from the dead. Hallelujah. And then he transferred that, that authority to, uh, to us, like I've already said. So the, the cubs that night were symbolic of God and man working together against that giant. The five giants uh, that David had to deal with, Goliath was number one, but how many of you remember he picked up five stones, but he thought maybe this one turned into a family thing. Yeah, yeah. there you go. And it did. You study David's life, he killed all of them. They all went down, eventually. Hallelujah. Yeah. Jesus, what looked like failure to his disciples, what looked like fail to, failure to the earth, Jesus got into the ball game at the right time. And he took care of business. And when he rose from the dead, Mary was standing there weeping, thinking somebody had stolen his body. He appeared to her and spoke her name. She knew who he was.